Welcome to the Calder Farmstead. Now the ice hogs back out to center in transition. Carlson with Quinville two on one. Right wing Carlson from the Quinville scores. Here's a chance for Barrett. Five he scores on the faceoff. Up it's Eminger. Go back to Wierenski. Has it. Shoots one. Bounces off a man. Five seconds left. Wierenski. Another jam on the shot. Turning it. Firing. And now, with nine minutes gone in overtime, the Bears breaking out right side with Bear. Looks like cutting to the net. Bear and let's go! Let's go! Let's go! And here are your hosts, CeCe and Sean. Hello and greetings from the mile high city of Denver, Colorado. And Tipperary, Ireland. Hi. Welcome to the Calder Farmstead Podcast, episode number 21 for Friday, March 19th, 2020. 21. If you were hoping for a podcast featuring famine resistant gene research for potatoes, we are not going to be much help. Sorry, Sean. This is an American Hockey League podcast, and my name is CeCe Hockley. And I'm Sean O'Brien. And as always, we thank you all for tuning in with us. If you're new to hearing CeCe and I talk about hockey, we're going to preview some of the matchups for the upcoming weekend for you. We both watch a lot of AHL games. We're going to talk about what we see when we watch the film, as well as use some advanced stats to help us break it down. If that's new to you, you might want to head over to our podcast feed or YouTube channel, wherever you're listening to us or watching us from, and check out episode zero. It's a short primer on some of the stats we're going to be talking about, as well as how we view what's important on the ice. So if you're new to some of the more advanced hockey stats terms like PDO or the point shares model, or newer hockey terms like controlled zone entries, Go check that out so you better be able to pick up what we're putting down. I promise it's not that nerdy or technical. It's only 20 minutes. And let's be honest, you wasted 20 minutes today on March Madness brackets and Googling what channel is true TV. Your brackets will all be busted by Monday. So why not spend a little more time with us talking hockey? Sean, you're making you're making some pretty valid points. That's all I got to say. <laughs> uh, well, hey, let's jump right into it. First and foremost, let's talk about the Utica Comets. And we were going to bring on Cody Severson, uh, and unfortunately, he was not available. So we'll get him next week to talk about the Utica comments and a double whammy of unfortunate things happening. Uh, the Rochester game against Utica was also postponed. So again, rescheduled due to COVID. I mean, that was the name of our last episode for crying out loud. So, well, two episodes ago now, but hey. We're still going to talk about the Utica Comets weekend and big focus on this and every weekend for Unica is going to be special teams. Yeah, Utica draws the most penalties per game in the AHL and they take the second most. Uh, Syracuse, who they play this weekend and most weekends, is 15th in penalties drawn, third in penalties taken. So a lot of the time in these games is spent 5v4 for one side or the other. Um I think Utica's power play works well, especially because they actually use the one, three, one formation to its fullest extent. Uh, They have Cole Lind on his offhand side on the half wall, but he doesn't just try to rip one timers. Although he does do that and is very good at that. Mm -hmm. Uh, He'll also work the punk, the puck in to the bumper, which is the middle of the three in the one, three, one. So that's not your guy who's kind of below the goal line and floats the, the far post. That's your guy. That's like right between the hash marks. That's the bumper. Uh, and, you know, you'll see Cole Lins, you know, make passes right to him to get shots from that inside slot area. Uh, that's been Sven, Bart- uh, Sven Bartocci the last, you know, little bit. Uh, he's been the bumper on Cole Lins, uh power play unit. Um, but they also use that Royal Road one-timer, which is a weapon that teams who set up in the one three one for some reason decide, like, they see Ovi and Patrick Line just rip these shots, you know, Steven Stamkos doing the same thing, and they're like, yeah, but what if we did something more boring and not as effective? While the Utica comments are not about that life, they use that play. I haven't seen them use the Oshi play yet, uh, but that doesn't mean they don't use it. I haven't seen 100% of their power play time this season, uh, so there's a good chance just in my viewings I you know, picked a game that I didn't see it or I saw it and didn't write it down. You know, St. Paddy's is a bit of a haze, so there's a possibility it went missing in the old memory file. Um, for those of you that don't uh, know, the Oshi play, as I refer to it, Uh, is basically when your guy on the half boards will draw the defenseman up and then he'll throw 
uh, a real quick pass to the guy below the goal line and he'll like one touch pass to the guy who's in the middle and he shoots it uh, usually near side post. It's a play that if you Google TJ Oshi power play or put TJ Oshi power play goal into YouTube, uh, like half of the highlights are this exact play. Now, continuing to talk about special teams here, uh, Utica's penalty kill. Now, is it good or is it struggling because Rochester is third in the league in the power play? I guess it's kind of a moot point since the game got canceled, but let's talk about it anyway. Why not? I mean, they're still going to play Rochester in the future. They have in the past. It's not happening this weekend, so maybe a little more tangential. Mm -hmm. But uh, I I think a good portion of it is probably having to play a talented team on the power play like Rochester. I, I think some of it is their penalty kill tactics, though. It's not the check press. Uh, it's actually, I think, that their four check that they use on uh, the penalty kill. It's a one one two, and it's way too aggressive. And by that, I mean they have their first four checker, their F one, basically at the bottom of the circles when the other team is trying to do a controlled break in, and then they have their second four checker, their F two, like at the blue line. So if that first four checker gets beat to one side or the other. Like that play is gone already. That ship has sailed. Your chance of holding them up in the neutral zone is basically moot. Like I have, I don't think I've ever seen a team in recent memory that uses a one-one-two that's that aggressive. Most of the time, you'll see that F one four checker at like the blue line, and then that F two four checker, that second one, will be like somewhere around the center ice faceoff dot. So when F one pushes him to his side the other four checker comes in and either forces a dump in forces an amazing pass across the ice or creates a turnover. But like, because they're so far from their own blue line and their, you know, defensemen, like they're not generating pressure at all. And they're just getting torched through the neutral zone. And that prevents them from like uh, what we talked about when we talked about Henderson and Colorado and their power play struggles is Henderson did a good job of basically just stalling, forcing Colorado to either, if they gained the zone to not be able to set up well, because once a team gets set up in its power play formation for most teams, it's the one, three, one, it's really hard to stop them from generating quality chances. So a lot of penalty kill strategy is basically, okay, how do we stop them from doing that? Effective four checking is one way. Most teams either use a one, three or a one, one, two, because you can't really get too much more creative with only four guys. And then they use the check press, but like, a lot of that forecheck is either if they don't prevent a zone entry, mm-hmm. it's making sure that that possession doesn't continue further and allow them to get set up. Because like I said, once they get set up, it's really hard to stop quality chances. So the fact that I think Utica has struggled is some Rochester is good and some their forecheck is not well used. I don't know if that's what they're trying to do, if that's how they're coaching it to be that wildly aggressive or if the players just aren't that familiar with it, which would be strange or some combination of the two. And it's the message just isn't getting in, but like they do it a lot and it's not working. Yeah. If you, it, you know, it, it, like the old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But if it is broke, you need to fix it. So yeah. there's that last, but not definitely not least a uh, man that was supposed to be playing with the Springfield Thunderbirds this year, but, uh, yeah, things changed. St. Louis Blues uh, hitching their wagon to the Utica Comets for their AHL affiliate this year. Sam, Sam Annis, he's going to be playing, and he has returned. So, yeah, where does he where does he slot in? Well, it's going to be interesting to see where he slots back in because, I mean, if we talk about Sam Annis, we have to talk about power play units because sure he's a power play machine, and I mean he's still really good five on five, but like he's way better on the power play where he has time and space. Um, See the because, Iowa wild last year and their ridiculous yeah. power play numbers when he was there for sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, it's also just, I want to point out too. Um, Sam Annis got literally zero games in, in St. Louis. Like he, you know, oh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure he got very familiar with, you know, the, the press box spread and stuff like that, but that's like, put him in. You, you, you clearly brought him up there and signed him because you thought he might be useful at the NHL level toss him in a game just one like but anyway they bring him back power play unit wise uh it used to be Annis, lind reinke bartucci and either walker or stevens um gadjevich is on the second unit with yasik and personally i'd like to see a power play one unit look like this 
where you have Cole Lind and Sam Annis on the right and left half walls, respectively, as they are both left and right-handed, so on their opposite sides. Bartucci is the bumper, Ranky up top, and Gadovich down low. I think you run the power play through Anas, let him work off the half wall there, maybe interchanging down with uh, Gadovich or with Bartucci as the bumper, but I think they could make a nice trio. I think putting Gadovich in the you know net fronts down low, that benefits his skill set. Bartucci's been really good at the bumper for the power play one unit this year. I want Cole Lind on that other half wall to just rip pucks. And I mean, I think Stevens would be a good keep here, but I understand they don't want to play five forwards, even though five forwards is so much more fun. But uh, I also think Ranky has done a good job uh, on the point there. So I would keep him there as well. And I would play that power play unit 75% of the, of the penalty. So if two minute penalty, I'm giving them in the neighborhood of a minute 30. So like if the puck gets cleared when it's about a minute, I'm leaving them out there for one more go. If they play the whole two minutes, you know, in the zone, they play the whole two minutes in the zone. But I think that's a better way to structure their power play instead of currently they have um, uh, Gadjevich on the second unit and they kind of have spread the wealth of their power play talent out. And I don't think that that's a good strategy. We've talked about it quite a few times before of, you know, jack up your power play one unit and let them play 75%. It's what a lot of NHL teams have started to do, uh, but not all of them. I, I think this would be a good move for Utica and one that would yield them some great results. Regardless, uh, I think Annis, Lind, and Bartucci should be kept together. Those three did some beautiful things um, previously when Annis was there, and his ability to just find seams where other guys will not, uh, especially on the power play where he has time and space and doesn't have to worry about a dude that's much, much bigger on, than him breathing down his neck. Um uh, I, I think that's the smart move. Yeah, it's definitely not, uh, you know, Colorado Eagles or Hershey Bears status, you know, 27th and 28th in the league down there at the bottom of the power play rankings. I mean, yeah, Utica's Utica's power play is, oh, let's see here. It's eighth in the league. Yeah, top 10. So you put Annis on that power play unit. Yeah, there, there's no reason why they can't s- succeed even even more with Annis and, and in the strategy that you lined out pretty effectively, if you're listening, Utica comments, I mean, Sean knows his shit. So <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, we have one game to pick for this weekend because of the, uh, you know, we prepare for this episode and then the league of course announces earlier today on Thursday as we're recording this that, Oh, by the way, uh, Rochester and Utica is postponed to be determined. So we have one game to pick. That's Saturday, Utica at Syracuse. Uh, Sean, I was going to say at least this time they were generous enough to not to wait, you know, and give us plenty of notice before we started recording, so we could cut the the Rochester parts out. Whereas last time uh, we literally got scooped live on air. But yep, uh, CC, give me a pick here. Who are you taking ah. on Saturday? Ah, oh, thank you, my good man. Um, you know, I think Sam and Os back is uh, is a good harbinger for him. I'm going to say Utica. I'm going Syracuse on Saturday. Okay. I think they've had a week off and they don't travel for the game. Monty looked good in wilkes barre Scranton, and the Crunch's rolling PDO is also at a sky high, almost 105. So I'm going to take another ride on the PDO train. Uh, Even though Utica's is pretty high right now, Syracuse's is higher. I'm hoping for a wild seven to six kind of game, but I probably won't get it. Um, but I, I am going to take Syracuse in an upset. Wow. That is a high PDO matchup right there. That's <laughs> wow. Yeah. It could go either way, but what does the model say, Sean? Uh, the model has Utica as a not insignificant favorite. They have them as a 56.1% favorite over Syracuse in Syracuse. Uh, so as uh, the other thing too is, as fans get la- allowed more into buildings, um, that home ice advantage will start to grow a little bit. Sure. Uh, but right now, it's pretty minimal. But there is a tiny one. But yeah, the model has them as a fifty-six point one percent favorite over Syracuse currently, and that does include their season-long PDO and correcting for it. So despite that, they are still a a pretty decent favorite against Syracuse. Well, there you have it. 
our first weekend quote unquote series previewed <laughs> and by series we mean one game but we were planning on a series like we said what can you do it's 2020 2021 this is the year that we're dealing with so one series down let's go and talk about the hershey bears the uh like i said the non-prolific the least prolific power play in the ahl they have usurped the colorado eagles as the worst power play in the league, four goals on 40 chances on the power play, 10% conversion rate. Colorado, five goals on 49 chances. They're now at 10.2. Woo, <laughs> Eagles, boy. Yeah, letting go of assistant coach Ryan Tobler. Apparently, that was a good move. So Ooh, anyway, <laughs> that's a rough take. Jesus. Oh, I know. I know. I'm terrible. But I digress. It's it's uh, that that doesn't have any direct correlation i was just mm, that was a rough take like sean said anyway hershey and bingo does this series even happen this weekend sean i have no idea as, <laughs> as far as i can tell uh i checked uh you know the ahl uh site i checked twitter before we started recording as far as i can tell as of you know at least uh 15 minutes ago yeah 15 minutes ago it was still uh, happening by the time this comes out, who knows? Uh, we may have a different story. Uh, Wednesday, uh, March 10th, game one, uh, game between Bingo and Lehigh Valley was suspended after one period due to COVID protocols because of a positive test result received during the intermission. Why they didn't wait to start the game until they had the test results, you say? That's a great question. We don't know why anyone would do that. But mm. then their St. Patrick's Day game was postponed. As far as we know right now, this Hershey uh, Hershey Bears Binghamton Devils series is on, but you know that's we don't know. We're hoping yeah. so. We're gonna we're gonna continue forward like it is. So, I mean, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep previewing the series like it is gonna happen. I mean, we there was that that Iowa. Uh, Texas series that we deferred on because we got, you know, th that Wednesday or Thursday game was canceled. So we're like, oh, we're not going to preview that weekend series because it's probably not going to happen. And guess what? It happens. So, you know, we're probably going to preview this and it's not going to happen, but I digress. Sean, okay. I, I, <laughs> I drove Hershey's power play into the ground with that intro. What gets fixed first? That abysmal Hershey special teams on the power play or the equally, if not worse, transition game of the Binghamton Devils, which gets the repair first. Ooh, I mean, Hershey <laughs> hasn't scored a power play goal in the month of March. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, we're, halfway, doing, we're over halfway through. Yeah, this is the 18th, and this is going to come out in the 19th. And Ugh. yeah, it's only been four games for them, but still, uh, that's not great. Um, and they've been doing the same bad tactics for quite a while now. We've talked quite a few times that Hershey gets into a one, three, one formation more or less, but then just tries to do point shots with traffic, which is not a very effective or reliably consistent means of generating offense. There are many other ways and many more useful uses of the one, three, one formation, which Run the Oshi listen, play for Christ's sake. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> like there are ways the capitals, their NHL parent club use the same exact formation to a much more effective extent there are ways that the a other AHL teams, I mean, we just talked about Utica doing exactly this and mm -hmm. Utica does it. Rochester does it. Chicago, do, like, I, you know, three quarters of the league does this, but the bears, they get in the same formation and then they just, yeah, point shots, one timers from half the ice instead of all the way across. They've been doing it for years now. I don't think it's going to change. I'm not sure which assistant coach and Hershey is responsible for it, but they're not doing a good job. Bingo's transition game, I think, has been worse than the Bears' power play this year. But the Bears seem content with using their strategy. I have to assume that at some point the Devils get it right. Uh, they haven't played a full game since the 10th. That's eight days ago. Uh, I have no idea what their practice schedule looks like during this time, even if they are able to get on the ice. But maybe if they have been able to get on the ice or they've been able to just sit and watch more video, this can be the reset button they need to kind of you know, get a couple of days of rest under them, watch some video, see what's supposed to be going on, um, and maybe clean this up. I mean, I have to believe at some point 
that Mark Dennehy is going to have an answer to why this transition game is just so abysmal, why they keep making you know bad pl- passes out of their zone, why they can't get out of the zone with possession, why they can't turn the few zone exits they get into zone entries. I mean, Ben Street is getting scoliosis from carrying this team, and at some point he's got to get some help, right? I mean, you'd think. I mean, you can't you can't just have one player, and especially, yeah, especially with how much I, I don't want to say how much promise that the Devils have this year, but I mean, we've we've talked about some of the other pieces of the Binghamton Be- Devils, and they're not a bad team on paper, at least not not as bad as they're playing currently. It's just, yeah. But anyway, let's shift over back to the Hershey Bears, and we'll talk about the recent. Uh, I don't want to say acquisition, but reassignment of Ford um, Aliaxi Protoss. Easy for me to say. Mm -hmm. Six foot six center, third round draft selection by the Capitals in 2019. Uh, He joins the Bears ahead of this weekend series. So, Sean, what should Bears fans know about uh, Aliaxi Protoss? Uh, I think there are three big takeaways that I can give you uh, going into this weekend without, you know, telling his entire life story on the ice. Sure. (laughs) Uh, Number one, he's big and can be physical, but his game isn't necessarily net front and along the boards. Um, He can play there, but he also does well using his size to maintain the cycle. He's got good uh, playmaking vision and surprisingly smooth puck skills for a guy that's that big. He does a lot of small details coming off the boards well, too. He can make plays in tight that you wouldn't expect from what looks like more of a blunt instrument, you know, just purely on paper. Uh, Second thing, defensively, he is not elite, but he's very good. He's played late game minutes when his team had a uh, a lead over in Russia. I wouldn't count on him for the penalty kill. But I think five on five, he's going to provide a good defensive boost. Uh, He knows how to get his stick into lanes. Uh, He knows how to read the play from a defensive aspect. I'm I'm saying I wouldn't put him on the PK because, third point, his skating concerns me as just about the skating of every guy that size usually does. But Mm -hmm. for him, he lacks explosiveness and short area burst, which is why I say He probably shouldn't be on the penalty kill because that's a pretty critical aspect of being on the penalty kill, especially using the check press formation that every penalty kill except for Iowa apparently does. Um, But that lack of explosiveness and short area burst, I think comes from his knees not being over his toe caps. His knees tend to go out on the sides more. And I think that that's what's sapping him from having a good, powerful stride. Uh, but those are my limited viewings of, you know, Russian hockey from America via laptop. So I, I don't exactly have GPS satellite definition here, but that's what it looks like to me when I see him skate is that his knees go out too much to the side instead of staying over his toes because that creates more leverage and you're able to actually generate much more power. Um, that's something that can be fixed with a skating coach. But uh, for right now, that's that's his biggest area of weakness. Otherwise, I think he's a pretty good prospect. Well, he'll he'll join Hershey ahead of his of this weekend series. Rather, um, Friday, Hershey takes on Bingo in Newark, New Jersey, at 7 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and then they'll come on back to Hershey, Pennsylvania, Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Sean, who do you got? I'm going to take Hershey on Friday and the Devils on Sunday. Um, In particular, I think Hershey is going to be eager to get into this game. And I think the Devils are going to be shaking off some rust from what is a long period off, which I have the impression that they haven't gotten a lot of ice time. And I think that that keeps them a, a little bit of a step behind Hershey on Friday. Uh, I think they find their legs a little bit uh, on Sunday and that they're able to uh, capitalize on the errors the Bears have made. Um, One of the other things that Hershey has not done well throughout the season is they have not defended the front of the net very well. They've allowed an alarming number of passes to the slot area and kind of just guys not tied up or they get lost in coverage from that area. And I think Bingo is going to be able to exploit that and I think Sunday, once they've kind of gotten their legs under them from a, a, some time off here, 
that that's going to be the game that they sneak away with one. I'm going to be the antithesis of uh, riding the PDO train and say that uh, the B devils are just bad. Yeah. It's just bad luck. You know, just, just poor, (laughs) they can't put it together. They're getting bad luck and yeah, it's a bad combination. And so I'm going to say Hershey sweeps because you know, when you have an eight game losing streak and then you go into a game with Lehigh Valley and it's, you know, called after one period and a one, one tie, you know, I, I just say that just the bad luck and, and not putting it together continues ninth and 10th losses in a row. If you don't count the Lehigh Valley. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to be the, the bearer of bad news and the, uh, the pessimist actually in this one. So quick, quick yeah. side note here. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that at any point, if this losing streak continues that Mark Dennehy's job is in danger? Uh, I mean, how often is it that a, an AHL coach loses their job mid season? I mean, I can't, I can't remember the last time that that's occurred. I mean, either a team, um, you know, like the, the Dallas and Texas stars organization, you know, Dallas fired Jim Montgomery. And so they had to bring up Derek Laxtall from Texas to, to fill in and, you know, bump up the chain and Neil Graham assumed mid season that those are different circumstances, but when your teams play as poor, Gosh, um, <laughs> I mean, you'd think if, if, to put together a nine and 10 game losing streak uh, during this wacky season, I mean, you should at least get one somewhere. I'd say his job is, I, uh, the Devils would be remiss if they didn't consider his job to be in jeopardy if they lose two games this weekend. I tend to agree. And I think if this were a normal, you know, season with fans and everything like that. Like if we waved a wand and COVID never happened and this was what was happening, I definitely think his, his season is in or his job is in jeopardy. Not like he could get fired mid season, but I think, you know, that first day of the off season, he could be finding a, a slip on his desk Monday morning. Um, but this year, I think he's going to get a pass mm. simply because of circumstance and that it's been more of a, you know, I don't care if, the the kids are bad you give them top six minutes kind of thing but i will say if he makes it through this season which i think he will but i would say he's going to be on a short leash in october come 21 22 and i think that's going to be where we start to hear if that season doesn't you know start off hot and running if nolan foot is still there and is not looking you know like he's ready for prime time I think then that's when we see, you know, the the rumors uh, warm up. But I think right of it, part of it now is just not just, you know, these are weird circumstances and he's just doing, you know, development things instead of focusing on winning games. It's also if they fire him, who are they hiring? Like, I, I, just, I can't think of anyone that comes to mind who's like, oh, that's a good coaching prospect from the ECHL, which is, you know, half working at half capacity or. Uh, the, you know, the CHL doesn't even have games really going. So like, I, I don't know who you would bring in to replace him or if you would just promote an assistant. That doesn't I was going to say, like... Sean, you're discounting the AHL way, which yeah, is just to promote the assistant. the assistant to head coach. <laughs> but like, I, I don't That's know. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But I, I, I think he manages to to stick around for the season. Anyway. The model, uh, making picks for this weekend here, uh, the model has a love affair with the Hershey Bears. I I have triple checked because at first when I saw it, I'm like, I must have programmed something wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I did not. It continues to love Hershey for reasons that are mathematically correct, but I cannot explain. Uh, Hershey is a 71.2% advantage on Friday in Bingo and a 71.6% advantage Saturday in Hershey. So not a big shift for home ice advantage because there are so few people there. Um, but you still, and there aren't fans in, in Newark, um, but you still see Hershey is a pretty sizable favorite. You don't get too much bigger in hockey than a 70 something percent favorite. Um, so the, the model loves Hershey. And that's another reason I picked Hershey for the sweep as well, but I didn't want to spoil the results of the mobile. So (laughs) there's that. Well, Hey, um, I'm going to disappear because, you know, as we do when we have guests, sometimes we record this out of order. And uh, yeah, so I'm going to disappear to re- go record a, uh, a podcast episode with Scott McDonald, Front Range Hockey, because, you know, had to take the night off on Wednesday and we're just getting it all done here on Thursday. You have another podcast? 
Sean, Sean, we've talked about this. Why can you not retain this information? How long has this been going on for? I'm not in love with you anymore, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I know you're heartbroken, but you're not my only podcast co-host. I know. You can you can feign you can it this has been fractured for long enough. I mean, it's just how it is. That's why I'm leaving. That's why just, you have just to just get out to of Paige. here and bring on Paige. Okay. All right. Listen to some ads, please. We need the revenue. Sean needs to get over his heartbreak. He'll he'll wipe his tears with some one dollar bills. Just listen to our sponsors for a little bit and then come on back. Listen to Sean and Paige. I'll be back. I'll be back. And we're back from break. Cece is off with some other podcast. I, I don't know how anyone records more than one. But uh, I am here uh, talking with Paige Seawertz of Full Press, uh, Full Press Hockey, who covers the Stockton Heat for us. Uh, we are going to talk about this weekend series that will be uh, in between Laval and Stockton. I mean, this is the clash of two titans in Canada. This is French-Canadian versus fake-Canadian. Uh, the Heat have managed to cool down a little bit after, you know, getting on an eight-game just hot streak. Uh, but now they've scored three goals or less in three straight games. They're one for ten on the power play in the last three. And after starting the season against the Marlies with, you know, pretty bad luck through two games, they've been on a nice little PDO bender. And as we've talked about with Chicago and uh, Henderson, you know, when good teams get good luck, this is what it looks like. Uh, Stockton has just trashed teams through eight straight wins, but uh, they looked a little mortal in the last game against Manitoba. Um, in general, Paige, are you concerned at all that Stockton is starting to cool down and these, you know, great results that they've put up so far are, are maybe going to start slipping away from them? I think uh, when it comes to that, I would be concerned if they were still on the road. Um, they finished that series against the Moose on the road, and they were on that extended streak, or the winning streak, obviously, but they were also on the road for seven or eight games, I think it was. So it was quite a stretch for them um, coming back home, having quite a long break. They've almost had close, not quite a week, but almost a week off. They've been getting some practices back in at the dome and everything. So I think they've really had an opportunity to kind of settle in back home, get some time to just kind of focus on the things that were kind of issues, even throughout the good parts of their winning streak. The coaches still have stuff to say about sometimes the starts aren't as, as hot as they'd like to be, or there's things that come up, especially the power play. They, um, I remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how they're at 40% for their power play percentage and what have they dropped to now? So there's certain little things I think they've been able to focus on when you're on a road trip and you're playing every second day, you're probably not focusing on too much. So I think they'll be okay. Um, in my opinion, um, they might kind of, they might not, I don't expect them to restart their winning streak by any means right now, but I think they can still pull a couple wins out in the next few games. Yeah, that that's, I think, completely reasonable. I don't expect them to fall completely off a cliff either, but I definitely, I mean, we talked about that power play percentage. That was always going to come down because 40% is not a sustainable success <laughs> rate for a power play. I mean, the... I think in the last 10 years, the highest uh, power play at the end of the season was like 26%. So yeah, they were never going to, you know, be doing 40 for the whole year. Um, mm -hmm. One other big piece of news is that Petrovic got called up while Stone got sent down. Petrovic has been a big part of the Heat's success this year and a player that I had to admit that I was wrong about from the preseason. Uh, I talked about him as being a just kind of ugly skater and more of a big physical defenseman who really lacked more high-end offensive skills. And he made me look dumb. So uh, he's been a much smoother skater, although I wouldn't say he's now, you know, the next uh, fastest skater in the AHL. He's definitely looked a lot smoother, a lot more polished. But he is currently in Calgary, you know, across the street or whatever at this point, and Stone is being sent down. And that is not exactly an equal trade-off for what the two of them bring to the ice. Um, now, we don't know, you know, if Petrovic comes back for any of this series or not, because uh, I've learned that the player moves from uh, taxi squad to the minors are mostly random. Um, but if Stone is going to be here for a while and Petrovic is going to be gone, how do you think that affects uh, Stockton as a whole? 
Well, I think um, with Petrovic gone, he was acting as captain and Fraze is still up with the Flames. So they're without a captain right now. And with a younger group, there's a lot of rookies on the team and everything, especially with COVID, especially with relocation and everything. They needed that veteran presence. And especially with his NHL background as well, I think that really helped mold the team together. Uh, Petrovic was kind of a guy I was I was aware of, but I wasn't noticing every game because he's not doing anything that is kind of, he doesn't showboat or anything. So he's not making the headlines. He's not the guy that all the press is running to talk to after every game, but he's on the score sheet almost every game. So he was very consistent. Um, I can't speak too much of how he was in the locker room, but based off of assumption, I think he was probably one of those, the key guys for them. Um, so I, I hope he's not gone for a long time. When I heard the news that there was some shuffling with the taxi squad between the flames, I honestly thought it was, um, to get some game time in for some of those guys that have been on the taxi squad this thus far um stone has yet to play a game this year ahl or nhl so i think this is just giving him some option to kind of warm up his legs a bit and then if there is any shuffling even something like some of the the lower end defensemen on the flames such as if shillington has a bad game maybe with sutter up there now he switches them out and has petrovic get a chance up there so i think it'd be great to see him have a chance up of the flames and i just kind of to be a little bit selfish with Stockton. I would like to have him back sooner rather than later, um, maybe halfway through the series kind of, or even at the tail end of the series, if Stockton doesn't get off to a very good start and they kind of start a losing streak, God forbid, <laughs> maybe they'll kind of need their captain back to kind of turn things around for them. So hoping for the best, but we'll kind of see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I'm curious to, to see if Petro gets some games in the NHL just to see if, you know, what what I've seen from him so far in the AHL season, the improved skating, some better puck skills, you know, moving the puck more in transition, if that's something that can stick for him in the NHL, because in his last NHL stint, when I remember him in Florida, it very much did not. And mm -hmm. um, the Panthers got derided real hard for protecting Petrovic in the expansion draft to Vegas while just being like, hey, would you like Riley Smith and Jonathan Marshall instead of, you know, Alex Petrovic? That sounds great. Um, but it's good to see him progress. And I'm curious to see if any of that translates or if he's not asked to do anything like that in Calgary. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the big things that comes with a coaching change, which I just remembered, as you said that, uh, that Calgary just switched head coaches is that, you know, you're the head coach now, whatever system you want to play is whatever system is going to get played. Exactly. So the idea that he might not be asking his defenseman to make those kind of moves to the neutral zone or to jump in on the weak side is a huge question mark and we have no idea i mean i don't remember the last time sutter was a head coach what that looked like because it was a while ago now mm -hmm. uh it was like the king's cup era that feels yep. like that feels like a decade ago <laughs> from what i've seen on twitter it's been a lot of skating there was a bag skate on the first day of practice when he showed up in calgary and i follow a lot of the flames media and i just see pictures that they post whenever they're at practice so that they're skating the length of the ice again so if petrovic doesn't like conditioning then <laughs> i don't know what to tell you <laughs> bag skating your team on the first day jeez that's savage I know. I thought I was reading it wrong because they just put the little bag emoji and I was like, what is, what is that got to do with it? And then I saw the video and I was like, oh no, they're not. But they definitely were. <laughs> wow. Established dominance early. All right. I guess. <laughs> All right. Well, Stockton definitely can't be happy with its second and third period efforts in the last game against the Moose. Uh, the Moose D had probably the best execution I've seen all season from any team on dumping retrievals, on making quick exits uh, to on possession changes in the D zone. I mean, once a defenseman for the moose picked up the puck in their zone, it was off their stick and moving in the other direction in those second and third periods at a rate. Like I said, I hadn't seen the AHL prior to that, prior to that, like they did flawless execution of some of those uh, just quick retrievals, turning it right up ice. And that really, you know, stunted a lot of the heats, uh, you know, signature four check where usually they're right up in your face, but they didn't get the opportunity because the Moose handled it really well. Um, and in the Heat's end, they had a lot of bad turnovers in their zone in those periods. A lot of failed exit attempts. Uh, the Moose kept them hemmed in their zone for a little bit. Uh, did that look like some of the earlier games that you saw from Manitoba? I know they obviously went Stockton's way, but did you mm -hmm. see kind of that forecheck not being as effective in previous games? Or was that not really the tale of those? 
I feel like in the first two games, especially, I didn't see a lot of that. Um, I kind of watching those games, I got the feeling that the Moose were a little bit stunned by Stockton. Um, they were kind of playing catch up the whole time. They were they were able to keep up with them score wise. Uh, it just seemed like they didn't really know what to expect. These are two teams that have never played against each other. So I think Stockton figured them out a little faster, but then the Moose figured them out by the end of the um, series to be able to turn that game around because I mean everyone has a weak spot and Manitoba exposed that yeah absolutely and I mean it's one thing to you know see something on video and to be prepared mentally it's another thing to have it you know right in your face as you're trying to you know as your back is to the boards trying to make a dump in retrieval mm -hmm. uh, the rocket on the other hand uh, they play a very similar game to Stockton so I, I hope that uh, Stockton got some time and practice to work on you know getting zone exits clean because Laval is a very similar team to Stockton in that aspect of relentless forecheck pressure and they're dangerous on the counterattack. They've had a lot of fun or they've been a lot of fun to watch this season where they're just picking pucks off in the neutral zone or in the offensive zone, turning it right around to offense. Um, Wheel, Blandisi, uh, Yolanan, those guys have been absolutely just a menace in, in transition, just picking pucks off, getting pressure, forcing bad passes, getting turnovers. They've also been rolling four lines all season, and at least three of Laval's lines are dangerous. That Batic Misic random guy from the crowd line, <laughs> not a serious scoring threat, but like their other three lines are like they're not name guys, they're not flashy, but they go in and execute really well. They forecheck really well, and they manage to counterattack really, really well. Laval's managed all of this with a season long PDO of 99.4 and a rolling two week PDO of 99.5 which for those of you playing along at home, 100 is, you know, a sustainable, normal number. The fact that Laval is within a sustainable, normal pace and is having these results is quite honestly kind of terrifying. A lot of that PDO for Laval is coming from shooting percentage, though, as Caden Primo has been inconsistent this year and has yet to put back-to-back -back quality starts together, despite not having a very challenging workload, given there's been a good defense and a steady diet of Belleville in front of him. I will say, though, I think the biggest key uh, to the winner of these games is going to be that four-check supremacy. Uh, Paige, if you had to you know, pick something that was a big key for this weekend for Stockton to absolutely get back to, uh, what would you say it is? Um, I would say consistency, um, consistency throughout the game. Um, when they're coming off their, their little break that they had and then, again, facing a team they've never seen before, that's going to put a pretty good contention against them. Um, I think they need to come out hot and they need to stay hot all game because if they slip at all, that's when Laval is going to jump on them. And that's when one of these games or multiple, um, many of these games could really get out of hand because um, I haven't seen much of Laval this year, but I've seen a lot of Stockton. So if there is, if they do start to slip, they do seem to kind of bring it back together, but they haven't been challenged as much as I feel like these next games are really going to challenge them. So I think it's going to, it's definitely going to rely on the start and then the finish as well if if they're um if they're behind in the third period they need to find a way to bring it back if they have a lead they need to hold a lead so i think some things to do with um their penalty kill is obviously going to be a huge aspect of it too and making sure that they're uh, staying consistent that way as a interesting to see how they handle laval yeah, and I mean, for me, I, I think the, the biggest key, like I started off saying there, is that uh, both teams are going to want to play counterattack games. They're going to want to forecheck really well. They're going to be really aggressive on the forecheck, which is great for us because that means a lot of potential for fun, entertaining games. Uh, there's, Ooh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of potential for, you know, back and forth track meet style games as one team just beats the forecheck of the other. And then it's, you know, walking through the neutral zone, three on two rush. Uh but I think whoever is able to establish their forecheck and force neutral zone turnovers for the long stretches, for the longest stretches, is going to win this series. Uh, mm -hmm. And given that both teams excel at that, uh, I think you're going to see either track meet style games where it's just one right after the other, or you're going to see one team just command one game, and then the next game it's going to be the other team doing the opposite, where just one team has the flow that night and the other one doesn't. So. I think we've managed to do a good job in the preview. Now it comes down to picks. Uh, they are playing a four game series, but we're a weekend only show here. Uh, and the Thursday night game is starting in like 35 ish minutes. And any pick that would be made for that would 
be rendered by the time this goes out <laughs> Friday morning. So, we're either going to be uh, really smart or really dumb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so you can either look brilliant in hindsight or really dumb in hindsight. Uh, yep. But we're going to stick to stick to the Saturday Sunday games. Both are two p.m. Both are at Stockton. I have notes from CC here. He is taking uh, Laval on Saturday and the Heat on Sunday. He thinks that Laval loses Thursday and then rebounds on Saturday, and then Stockton rebounds their rebound. Uh, Paige, how are you feeling about this series? Who are you taking in these two games on the weekend? Um, I think I might have to agree with CC there, uh, but in a different way. I kind of – I do have a lot of faith in Stockton. Don't get me wrong, but I feel like they might come out a little slow tonight. Again, I can't – as far as when this comes out, I can't speak for the past in that sense, but I am not thinking too highly for a win tonight. And I think that might roll into a little bit of a losing streak. They might go three games and then kind of snap back into it. I think there's just been too many changes to their lineup. Um, they've, they felt like they had kind of their two go-to goalies. They had their captain there kind of to place phrase and everything. So I think it's going to take a couple games for them to kind of figure out their new lines and figure out everyone else's role again. So I would say we'll see what happens tonight. And obviously you will know tomorrow. Um, and then I think they, they may lose like again on Saturday and then bounce back Sunday to kind of split the series with them. All right. I am very torn here. Um, the heat without Petrovic and showing some signs of cooling down. Concerns me, Laval having goaltending consistency questions, coming in to play the team with the best shooting talent in Canada. That scares me. Um, I, I struggle to think that one team really runs away with this entire four-game split, let alone just our weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to take the opposite split of uh, you guys. I'm going to go Stockton Saturday and then Laval Sunday. Uh, I think for some reason that you might see a Petrovic return but I'm not counting on it, but I, I, I think that might play in a little bit. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going stocked in Saturday and then um, I'm going to say the Laval rebounds um, because either Caden Primu doesn't start or he starts and gets his act together on Sunday. Uh, the model uh, that uh, we use with point shares has Stockton as a 50.4% favorite um, in each individual game which is basically a coin flip. Even the model yeah. is like, yep, these two are right up against each other. Uh, so it's going to be a close one each game, even if it might not always look uh, that close at the end of the scoreboard. I think these are two mm -hmm. very good teams, uh, and we're going to see some hopefully exciting hockey. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be stunned. If there's one, if there's a sweep in this series, I'm going to be absolutely stunned. I will not believe my eyes. But we, we don't know. We've, they've, these teams haven't seen much of each other at all. So we'll see how the dynamic goes that way. And I think you're right. It's going to be some exciting hockey to watch. Absolutely. Paige, thank you very much for your time. Uh, good luck covering the game tonight. And uh, where can people find your work if they are interested in you know, reading your work, seeing you on Twitter, that kind of thing? Yeah, like you mentioned at the start there, I, I will be on Full Press Hockey on the website there. We do have an AHL section, so you can find the Stockton stuff there. And I will be live tweeting today's game. I don't know if I'll get to this weekend's, but I'll have some updates there. And you can find me at Flames underscore update. All right. Thank you once again, Paige Seward. Have a good one. You too. Thanks, Sean. All right. And we are back, or at least I'm back. And... Sean's back and we've got Elaine on the program. I, boy, uh, just decided to just jump right in with Elaine since Sean jumped <laughs> right in with Paige. <laughs> so, heard about Elaine, his fair play. Hey, you know what? Sean, while I was recording Front Range Hockey with Scott McDonald, Sean took the reins. He, he took Paige on and, and they had a great conversation one on one. Now we've got HL Central Division correspondent coming back on the program on the Calder Farmstead, Elaine Shercliffe. Elaine, welcome back to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. I just noticed that my name really does say Elaine. Elaine. <laughs> Are you going to start doing the Elaine <laughs> dance from Seinfeld? I know. Low hanging that's, fruit. That's literally how I dance. Yeah. <laughs> Must be an Elaine thing. Elaine, Elaine. You well, just hey, are born that way. It, it, yeah, it just has to be part of the name. It's just a prerequis <laughs> prerequisite to have the name. Well, hey, Elaine, we're going to talk a little bit about the Rockford and Iowa series coming up this weekend, since this is our weekend preview show. So, uh, Scott, 
or Scott. See, I'm front range <laughs> hockey and I'm calling calling Sean the wrong name. Sorry. Boy, we're not starting this off on the right note at all. At least I'm not. Somebody's still drunk okay. from St. Patty. <laughs> Shoot. Fans, fans, if we're <laughs> if we we're not nothing if not a fun group, a fun bunch of people. So Sean O'Brien, the co-host of the Calder Farmstead podcast, is gonna talk about some goaltending voodoo with Matt Tompkins against the Grand Rapids Griffins. Sean, you have the floor. Elaine, you may chime in as you wish. So Matt Co Matt Tompkins did the voodoo against Grand Rapids. Stopped 88 and 90 in his last two against the Griffins for a 977 save percentage. He's quietly strung together six quality starts in his last seven appearances. His save percentage is now 20 points higher this season than his career average in the AHL. Now, that's not a terribly lengthy career, but still, and I've seen the question raised, is this actually voodoo or is Matt Tompkins becoming a good AHL goaltender? I personally think this is very likely voodoo. I'm not <laughs> saying for sure, you know, development of goaltenders is by no means an exact science, but there are a lot of reasons in which I think this is uh, voodoo. And let's start with, some, let's start with one of them here. Uh, number one, this is an eight game sample. If ever you were going to point to a number and say, well, that's probably just not a big enough sample size. I think eight is still well under that threshold of, I believe what I see from a goaltender. Uh, his best season dating, uh, his best season uh, average save percentage dating back to college was 912 in Indy over 25 games. He's been a pretty league average ECHL goaltender over 79 games with a 907 career average in the ECHL, which is right around the league average. And he was kind of mediocre in college, uh, an 898 goalie over his NCAA career. Now, those aren't awful numbers, but those are also leagues that are below the AHL. I also think that he's getting a lot of shot volume because Rockford is basically just letting anyone and everyone into their offensive zone. And they're firing pucks at him from everywhere. And that's at everyone. least padding some of those stats. Go ahead, Everyone. Elaine. No, I mean, everyone. Like, I'm waiting yeah. for them to play a team that has fans in the building and just all of a sudden the fans on the ice in the, in the, you know, the D zone, just sitting on the crease. Throwing yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised when they do like the intermission <laughs> things where they shoot the puck down. Like they're actually just going to keep, keep him in net, you know, cause he's been stopping shots from everybody else. But like of goalies that's played at least five games this season, he's fourth, sh fourth in shots face per game with 31.78. Like, yeah. Insane. That's, it, it, that's a crazy high number. He's getting shelled basically every night. And that kind of is giving him some cover to the fact that he's still letting in a lot of goals. Like because he's facing so many shots, yes, he's stopping a bunch of them, but he's also still letting in three, four goals a night. That's not great. And also when I watch his film, like he still gives up dangerous rebounds off of low danger shots from bad angles. Yeah, he doesn't finish, right? Like he doesn't finish the catch. He doesn't like... When he closes his five hole, he doesn't stay down. He pops up just enough that a puck, if someone pokes it, it's going to go right through. There's no, like, strong, like, grasp of the puck. It's like, oh, I got it. <laughs> like, I got it, guys. Oh, oh look, it's, it's like, a butterfly. It's like a cat <laughs> pawing. That's what, that's what you this... look like. When... <laughs> <laughs> Is this a good goal? <laughs> Is this a good save? I think so. Hmm? But just I mean, Rebound control is a huge thing, especially when you talk about like just getting lucky that rebounds don't plop on the stick of the guy who's standing there and instead your defender gets it or it does get him on the stick and he hits the post, shoots it wide, just miraculously shoots it right back into you, which uh, I've seen a lot with uh, Stuart Moonshine Skinner. And that like Grand Rapids also hit a what felt like a ridiculous number of posts in that series. Oh, I mean, yes. I, it, it just felt like they hit at least four mm -hmm. in the last two games. Do you think they did it just to scare people? Like, oh, it's too quiet in here. Let's make some noise. Maybe it'll scare them into knocking the puck into the net. Like, I have never <laughs> seen so much inaccuracy from, from the Griffins. Because there were times when the net was open and they could have gotten it in. And then it was like, ding. Just yeah. kidding. Sometimes, like, that's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I think it's more likely voodoo because there have been a lot of good luck things like him getting beat, but at the puck hitting the post or a rebound on a wide open net going wide. And I mean, even the goals he let up were not like 
oh, they got left out to dry. And that, like, one of them was, but not all of them. And yeah. That, well, <clears throat> go ahead, Cece. It, it's, it's not like he's a, you know, a, a youngin either. Like, he's... He's 27 years old. He's not a 19, 20 year old coming out of juniors, you know? So, you know, his, his window's kind of, kind of closing. If you ask me. That hurts. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's so weird when people talk about age and then it's like, they're 27, their time's coming to an end. And I'm like, <laughs> so that's great. I'm 35. And Sean and I are in <laughs> Sean and I are in our mid thirties too. So yeah. it's, I mean, it's, but we're talking sports here. I mean, I you, you should be used to it by now. But LeBron, I'm, I'm LeBron still playing. I, I, I've oh, accepted he... that I am way past my prime, even for podcasting. <laughs> so you guys are really getting the back nine of my career here. And Listen, I, don't even know, <laughs> I don't even know how to skate. I just. But that's, like all of those okay. late blooming goalies that like you think about, you know, Tim Thomas, Jordan Bennington, Ben Bishop, Cam Talbot, like at the minimum, all of those guys had really good seasons in the minors before, mm -hmm. you know, they blossomed into the beautiful butterfly that, you know, was their goaltending career yeah. or in Cam Talbot's case, the pretty good butterfly that was his goaltending career. Um, right. But like Tompkins has eight games. I I'm, I'm at least hoping that that works out for them. Cause it felt like Rockford hasn't had, you know, a guy for a while. So that fan base, you know, I, I, I want them to, mm -hmm. to have nice things. Like they're small, but they're very fiery. So oh, I hope yeah. it works out for them. I just don't think it will. Yeah. So there's a few things. Um, well, one, you know, one of the other people that covers the team um, from, it's called from center ice. She was like, well, um, either there's some sort of magic up in Chicago and he brought it back or Kevin Lankinen is actually under there and he's getting some reps in, <laughs> With, <laughs> which I could see. <laughs> Jean-Claude Van Damme from <clears throat> Sudden, you know, Sudden Death, you know, putting on the Penguins gear. Kevin right. Lankinen's doing the same thing. In Why not? Why not? Um, I think on the other hand, though, is all the Chicago teams got together and they were like, um, so Chicago's going to need a really good, like, keep having really good goaltenders. What could we give up? And they were like, <clears throat> well, um, we should just blow the bears up a little. So if you give him magic powers, we will take Andy Dalton. <laughs> That's what well, I think happened. This is um, the sacrifice you're willing to make. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Dalton. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh. Um, but seriously, I think that. It's a pandemic year. He's going up. He's going down. I think that he knows that he has to do something good because if any one of those other goalies starts to catch fire, what happens? You're not playing. You're just sitting. So I think with him being up top and seeing other players play and talking with the coaches and then seeing that the other goalies that were playing weren't awful. I mean, they weren't great, but realizing that they are like on par the same, he realized he needs to kick it up because, like you said, his age. And every <clears throat> team, unless you're super proven, is going to go with a younger guy who's struggling over the older guy who's struggling, which, I mean, you unless should. Unless they're Kale Morris. Well, yes. <laughs> In a word. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, for this upcoming weekend against the Wilds, I think one of the big keys for Rockford is they need to get their transition to work badly. I mean, in the, the series against Grand Rapids, their forechecking was just not getting the job done. I mean, it was it so weak. Like it, yeah, it looked like at times they weren't even, you know, holding up the, the Griffins in the neutral zone just to be polite, like a nice traffic stop. Yes. Uh, They're like, oh, this is a yellow light. <laughs> yeah, not even a yellow light. It was full green light the whole the whole time. And basically the light was out and everyone on the Griffins forgot that when a light is out, it's a four-way stop. They were just like, oh, yeah. let's go, baby. Yep. <laughs> but like they're not even getting pressure with F1. And that's I mean, not even like kind of maybe, you know, challenging the the puck here. Nope, he's not doing anything at all. And that's not gonna get it done in any level. 
And I, I think Iowa struggled plenty in transition. I mean, yes, it's Chicago, but like, I, I think this is a good opportunity for Rockford who I think has a better team than how they perform. Not a good team granted, but a not dumpster fire team. I think this is a good opportunity to have a kind of get right moment for their four check and their transition against Iowa, who has struggled a lot recently with that. And yeah. it, it, it's especially important too, because when they generate rush chances, <clears throat> their forwards seem like they're just skating along the dot line, waiting to get pushed into the boards. Like they gain the zone in most cases, not that hard. Uh, and then they just get pushed towards the wall. They throw a low danger shot on goal or they heave a, a Hail Mary hero pass to the slot. And I don't see a lot of like what, what you would think you'd be practicing. Uh, you'd be working on during practice, circling back to find a trailer, working to get inside, continuing behind the net to establish a mm -hmm. cycle. Like it just seemed like when they generated those few and far between and very valuable, you know, rush chances, they were just throwing them away. And so, if almost like they to... were scared, right? Like it seems like I don't want to say, I mean, scared is probably a different, like a weird word to use, but I feel like they get nervous to be good. Like they're afraid to be the one that misses the net or um, rushes too hard and then creates like animosity. Like they seem. To fear failure? Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, I feel yeah, yeah, I feel like they're fearing failure because there are times you see them and they're going at that net and you see it and you're like, oh yes, it's gonna happen. Then they go, Oh, then maybe I'll pass it over to this guy who actually happens to be from the other team. Oh my gosh, my bad. Yep. <laughs> like I, Cece and I talked to this in our episode zero about like how valuable rush chances are. And you can't just keep, you know, airmailing pucks from nowhere, hoping them that one of them will sneak in and you get to look, uh, you know, good for a couple shifts. for in right. your guys. And in the so, central, you have to rush. You have to rush the net, especially this season. It, it seems like the goalies are very, a lot of the goalies are prepared to be rushed, but the amount of rushing, there's only so much they can take. So if you keep rushing the net, peppering them with shots, Maybe not against Beck Warm, because for some reason he like thrives off of everyone getting in his business. But with <laughs> with that exception, if you can just keep rushing the net in the central and you get the defense frustrated or tired, the goalie is trying to do everything then and they're gonna slip up, right? Like they're in the AHL for a reason because they're gonna have those slip ups. Right. One bright spot I do want to point out about Rockford, because good things do happen on that team. Uh, Dylan McLaughlin is two goals, five assists for seven points through 10 games, which I think terrible. It's not, you know, he's not going to be winning player of the week or cream of the crop, maybe, but like that's still notable. It's also notable because it identically matches his totals from last season in 28 games. So in 10 games, he's already matched last season in 28. And I think when I watch him play, I've seen him do small details better. He's used deception on his shots uh, where he's looked off the goaltender like he's going to make a pass and then rips a shot in. That's a small detail that, you know, a lot of guys from juniors have to pick up. His puck skills also look improved to me. He's catching passes better. He's making small moves off the wall better. Little details like that, too, are often a big difference between guys that get stuck in the AHL and guys that at least, you know, get a chance to maybe if they're not, they don't have the biggest toolbox or the most raw skill set, they still get a chance to, you know, uh, a shot in the show because they do small things well and can apply that in a, you know, nine minutes a night kind of role in the fourth line. I don't know if that's his future, but I will say he has been a bright spot for Rockford this year. Yeah, he also, um, he's really quiet. And I say quiet in the sense of sometimes I forget he's on the ice. And then he does something good, like, I mean, like really good, you know, something that really gets you to pay attention to him. And so I started watching him a little bit more closely after I realized that I missed like a half a game of him playing because I just, for some reason, didn't notice him. And I realized that's his game. Like, I think that's his game because in um, these ga this series with Grand Rapids, I noticed sometimes they would like, he would see them coming to drop a play from someone else and he would just casually drop back and then kind of like move a little bit around and then open himself up 
and there would be like three guys on someone else and he would just be like hey what's up pass to the puck <laughs> like you know um it's and exactly I think exactly what he's saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, what's up? Pass me the puck. Over here, I, right? I I really, really quiet, want some, right? I really want a player to say that in an empty arena so that we can actually hear it on the AHL TV. Uh, <laughs> that would be replayed the hell out of. Hey, what's yeah. up? Pass me the puck. <laughs> on repeat on on social media for ages. Ages. <laughs> Um, but he that's something that you need at all levels, at the NHL especially. So if he can really hone that and embrace that aspect of his game, he will become a deadly um, a deadly player up top. The, the thing is, is those kind of players often get overlooked. Um, they're the number one player that fans want to trade. Because they're like, oh, he's not really loud. I never, really, like, yeah, his points say this, but, like, we never see him. And, oh, that always drives me nuts. But scouts, because, like I said, if I'm not looking at him or I wasn't covering this team as often as I am, I would totally just kind of forget about him until he does something like score or set up a beautiful play. And the thing is, is he's helping set them up as, like, the fourth – assist so like he's like the fourth man on the play so not even like the assist after the secondary you know like he's far enough away that he's able to draw up these plays and he's almost like a conductor sometimes but like of a really silent <laughs> song you know <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah that is a yeah that's a very that's an apt uh comparison there so yeah. all right well let's get to picks for this weekend, uh, even though technically Monday will be happening as we're recording, but you know what? We, we started as, with this as a weekend series and then it got moved, but damn it, we're keeping it as a weekend <laughs> series. So we're going to, to pick both games here. Uh, CC, fire us off. We got Sunday, 6 p.m. at Rockford, Monday, 6 p.m. at Rockford. Who you like? Sean, where are your manners? I'm going to defer to our <laughs> guest, Elaine. <laughs> Fair, I, fair, I know. very fair. I, I don't know what I was thinking. Hey, you know what? I started I started this segment with Elaine in the in the room, like in, in the introducer, and then yeah, I called you Scott. So you know what? We're just you having did, a hell of a you did do that. I so. did do that. So in all, all fairness, I've Scott I've called Scott Sean before as well. So anyway, Elaine, who you got? Oh gosh. Okay, so there's this weird part of me in my gut that's like. Rockford's going to sweep and it's going to be like five to zero and three to two. I don't know why. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to go with it. I'm going to say, even though my gut sounds crazy, that I'm going to go with it because one thing, if Matt Tompkins and the other goaltenders, because I'm not sure which ones would make a play or anything, because Literally in any of the teams this year, it's like a game time thing because you don't know who's getting called up or down for the taxi. <clears throat> um, but if Matt Tompkins is on the incline, you got to ride that, right? Like, see what happens, ride the magic while you can. Um, but also, Iowa's shots are very dainty. Um, they are accurate. And they get there with speed, but not with chutzpah. Like, <laughs> uh, they were a lot better. <laughs> they were a lot better last weekend. Um, they looked a little bit stronger, but they're still not there. And so if the defense can be like, oh, okay, I'm going to get that and take it out as fast as they can, they'll have a step up. So unless Iowa fixes that little problem, I don't see them getting a lot past Matt Tompkins. Um, yeah. That's that. All right. Well, yeah. for me, Brennan oh. Peary just got sent back to, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, Scott. I mean, CC. Boys, boys. <laughs> don't make me right, turn CC, this around. Ahead. Um. Mama Elaine. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right. Sean, go ahead. <laughs> well, Brendan Peary just got sent back to Rockford. And unless Derek Barabo escapes whatever dungeon he's locked in uh, and gets in starts for Iowa, 
I'm taking Rockford to sweep here too. If Barabo plays, I will take the wild in those games as I think he's the best goaltender on either team, but Iowa doesn't seem to realize that. And they like, you know, shaming Hunter Jones by continuing to trot him out there when he's not ready for this level. Might as well give him some reps. YOLO. There's no Calder <laughs> Cup at stake that we know COVID, of. COVID season that we know of, right? So yeah. CC. Last, last but not least, <laughs> Iowa. I was on a five game skid. I think they break that on Sunday, and then Rockford has enough of their shit and uh, takes a game on Monday. Um, I would like to see Iowa win. I like to th- keep things interesting in the Central. Like sure. now that I'm covering all the teams, it's like. Give me fuel, give me fire, give me that which I desire. Chaos. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> chaos. <laughs> like that's all I'm asking for this year. It's 2021. Let's just be chaotic. Yes. All right. Uh the model for the record is slightly higher on Rockford, a 56.5% favorite in either game. Uh so not a huge favorite, but still a favorite. Uh, the model likes Rockford. All of us seem to at least think Rockford is going to take one here at minimum. So interesting weekend ahead. Uh, one last thing that we do want to touch on since Elaine, we have you here. And this seems to be the hot topic du jour in the AHL outside of, you know, what's going on in the ice is the CHL NHL agreement. And I just want to kick us off by saying one thing about this. Uh, so let's, do a quick overview here if you haven't already heard or read the nine thousand things out there it feels like from the past two weeks about what this is basically it's when an nhl team drafts a chl player they are not allowed to play in the ahl or echl i suppose uh until they've played four fulls like until they've exhausted their juniors eligibility which is 16 through 20 if the nhl team puts them on their nhl roster then they're allowed to stay but as soon after that they have to go back to juniors there's no ahl for them and this has been an agreement that's been in place for a while. It expired in 1920 and then got, you know, one year emergency renewed for this season. But we've been able to see these players in the AHL because they can't go to their CHL teams until somewhat recently. And that's had a lot of chatter about like, wait, why are we doing this again? Which is kind of my point is that this is the most NHL agreement ever. Because I just want you to picture a similar scenario in another major sport. Like, could you imagine a world in which the Kansas City Chiefs draft Patrick Mahomes and aren't allowed to have them on, aren't allowed to have him on the roster because he has two years of eligibility at Texas Tech? And that everyone, including like Roger Goodell and Andy Reid, would just be like, yeah, I mean, it would be nice if we could have him in our facility with our coaches and our playbook and stuff learning, even though we don't think he's ready to start yet. But I guess the NCA has a point. Like, could you imagine that world happening? Because I man. can't. The NFL would nuke that deal in a heartbeat. <laughs> you know, me as NFL a Denver fan would be okay not with to that. Make money for- <laughs> I said, me as a Denver fan would be okay with that. <laughs> me as a Browns fan, me as a Browns fan this year would be okay with that as well. <laughs> But like that would also oh, mean yes, Baker yeah. Mayfield would still be in Oklahoma. Like, okay, but would that mean that like? I'm also a Bears fan, so would that mean that Mitch Trubisky would still be, be not in, would be yeah, in Buffalo that's... now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I totally tried to forget about Andy Dalton for a moment there. But like that, like there's no <laughs> world in which that would exist because the NFL would be like, your business model isn't our job. Like the CHL clearly gets a thing out of this. They get you know their star players in their city, so fans come to the games. What does the NHL get? What does the A no the real oh the real I'm sorry I had to call on Jesus for a second. <laughs> the real question is what does the AHL get out of this? Um people constantly bring up to me, like fans of the CHL bring up to me, well, they depend on that money. Oh, oh, the AHL doesn't, and the AHL never has to deal with that. How many times at the end of season is a team going on a run and then the NHL is like, I'm going to take all your players and make them sit because they're black aces. And then you don't have them. You know, they, I'm sure that's annoying. I'm sure it stinks most of the time. Um, But if your fans are only there to see top players, then maybe you have an issue marketing your league. 
and you should learn to market it better. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> not trying to be mean. I'm, <laughs> please don't be offended. Don't come for me and my <laughs> ads, people. <laughs> um, you can come at me. I don't care. <laughs> Sean could give two hoots. <laughs> um, but also, there are some players that should still be down there. You know, like some players could still use some development at that level. So there should definitely be some sort of amendment made. You know, Seth Jarvis should not be playing in the WHL. Phil Tomasino should not be in the OHL when they start playing again. Just no. And there's a lot of reasons why. Um, one, you don't want their development to stale. And if they're already doing really well with the fundamentals and they're on a team that has bad habits, they're more likely to pick up those bad habits. Secondly, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of players, uh, parents about their youth hockey when I worked in youth hockey. And um, I interviewed Trent Vogel Huber's mom uh, when they were going through the Calder Cup run. And she explained to me that part of the reason why he left St. Charles, which was a decent team and went to the AAA Blue Jackets when they first started, is because he was going to get hurt. The possibility of him getting hurt because someone else was doing something stupid or unskilled um, was that much higher. And so you need to protect your investment and your person as well. So if you're putting them in those situations where someone accidentally like trips them up because they're not good with their stick um, or they don't know how to cut right when they're on the ice and just kind of stop. And then next thing you know, the kids in the boards, those things can happen at the junior level. And I'm not saying that like it's not valuable because I feel like it is a valuable tool for for um, people in that weird limbo land to learn. So I think it is still valuable and it's a good pool to pull from because you don't want to sit there and say it's not worth having them around because then there'll be all that animosity and that's just too much drama to deal with. But also at what point does it become about the athlete's career then, you know? Um, I, I've heard that Seth Jarvis wanted to go back. I mean, like he didn't mind going back because it's like, oh, I get to be with my buddies again. Um, like a last hurrah. But you could be setting yourself up for your career. You could be making money to play the game you love. I know not seeing your friends or playing with them stinks. Um, but in the same token, you going back down there and you're far and away better, you're taking a spot from someone who needs to be in the CHL to get better. If you're just there for funsies, air quotes for people that are listening, funsies, yeah, it's not going to do you any good. It's not going to do the team any good. Well, it could do the team some good because kids will learn from you. But it, there are people it's going to hurt as well. Um, yeah. I could honestly and, talk about this for like five hours, but those are my bullet there's, points. <laughs> there, there's something too when you look at guys who come straight out of junior and were high draft picks and they go right into the NHL and they don't look good because they're used to playing against guys that are their size, their skill level, their strength. Or, or smaller. Like yeah, I mean, they're playing against what, 16 year olds, right? 16, 17, 18, you know, it's mostly right. between 17 and 19, but yeah, 16, 17 year olds. The, the only caveat I would put on uh, when a CHL player can come to the NHL or the AHL is they have to finish high school. That's the only thing in which yeah. I'm like, nope, you you need to finish at minimum high school, like with a diploma. I don't care how shady the business deal you do with the principal is to make that happen if you're a, an idiot. But like that one, I at least I'm like, nope, you need to at least be a high school graduate before we can send you to the AHL. Because if you're going to the AHL, there is no way you're telling me you're studying for that chemistry test. Like, I don't believe you. Right. Uh, but uh, I, I still, I still don't see the NHL side from this where they're just like, yep, we're totally willing to give you our players and development and get basically nothing in return because the CHL's finances aren't the NHL's responsibility. And if you want to say that the NHL should have a financial stake in the CHL, I'd say if they were going to back a league for the development of the sport, there's a women's league that could really use that money a lot more than the CHL. There are two women's leagues that could use that money. Very Just true. saying. Yep. No, I don't want to. 
No, no, no. But like, yeah. it's one of those things where I just, I don't get why it's the NHL's job to make sure the CHL is profitable. Like that doesn't affect right. them. They're just right. basically handing over prospects to the CHL that should be theirs or the choice should be free to those players to do what they want right. with their career. Right but- now. Sorry. Now I can totally see. I mean, yeah, some teams do. It's hard money wise. I get it. And I can see them trying to be like, well, if this brings you money, like throwing them a bone essentially, or trying to work in tandem with them, because if they don't have it, what are they pulling from when they're drafting? But at the same time, like I said earlier, market better. Like the AHL has to deal with it all the time. And I, I I don't believe that like if this caused the CHL to financially collapse, that like somehow the drafts. I, I mean, I, I see what your point that yes, the CHL does ben- like its existence benefits the AHL, but I don't think if it somehow financially collapsed that like the drafting of kids would be you know like something wouldn't come up in its place in order to fix that like power vacuum. Junior hockey in general like has been around for a long long time. And I don't think the CHL is what's propping that up because the USHL, like they aren't nearly as profitable as the CHL, but they stick it out every year and they don't really have the like, yes, they honor that. They don't send their kids to the NHL, but they also don't have to because most of them don't get drafted. So like, it's not that big a problem for them to have a a second tier of star to, to be missing. And I think at the same time, like, the NHL should be doing what's better for its product right now. Cause that's the bottom line for them. The CHL is like a distant charity thing. That's, you know, third down the line of things we need to fix. But like, if you're telling me that Jack Hughes could have played a year in the AHL last year, and yes. then this year would be, would have been a star or Capo Kakinen who should be in Hartford or uh, Alex Lafren- Lafreniere, like who still probably should be in Hartford. Like, but because they can't be in normal se- in seasons, like their NHL product suffers. Is that what you want, NHL? And I ask that openly because it's the NHL, so maybe. Did you mean Capo Caco? Yes, I said Kakanen, didn't I? You did. <laughs> that's okay. That's, that's just yeah, how that's, this segment No, I meant Capo Caco. <laughs> Capo Caco. We're saying all part. the wrong names tonight. Yes, we are. <laughs> well, hey, so before you guys go on any more, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm also I mean, working on an article about it. I mean, this is like I said, I could talk five hours. Well, we'll we'll look out for that because I always enjoy your writing, Elaine. I mean, that's oh, why I, that's why I recruited you to full press hockey. Imagine that. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So, Elaine Surecliff, you can find her on Twitter at I'm a Rain Dancer. Rain is spelled R A I N, and you can also see all of her great Central Division work at www.fullpresshockey.com and so elaine once again thanks for coming on thanks for having me of course always we will catch you on monday ta-ta for now (laughs) bye-bye deuces deuces (laughs) all right well thanks for elaine thanks to elaine for coming on and we are going to get into the Pacific Division when we get on the other side of these advertisements. So hang with us, listen to the ads because it's more money in our pocket and more cash for Sean to travel to Ireland and stay there for a little bit of time. So after these messages, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. All right. And we are back. Once again, we thank Elaine Shercliffe from coming on uh, HL Central Division correspondent for Full Press Hockey, doing a great job covering all six teams this year. And uh, gosh, I got to tell her to rein it in sometimes because, you know, she just puts the pedal to the metal and I'm like, Elaine, you got to pace yourself, you know, six teams, even in this season, it's, it's crazy. She does a lot of good work and yeah, she's, she brings a lot to the table. I'm really thankful to have her on when she comes on. So, all right, central division was covered. Now we're going to go out to the Pacific division. Of course, my realm, my favorite realm, because it is my realm I'm covering the Eagles, but Tucson and San Diego, the Eagles have the weekend off. You know, they, they played four games in six days against Texas. Three of those four games, they took the victory in, including two overtime wins. So very impressive from Colorado, bringing themselves to 500 in the points percentage. But I digress. We're talking Tucson. We're talking San Diego. Roadrunners and goals. Let me tell you. 
Zegris, Trevor Zegris, being up with Anaheim, the hangover is real. Yeah, the goals are two and eight since Zegris got called Ooh, up to Anaheim. Uh, Drysdale has two points in six games since uh, he had eight points in eight games with Zegris. Mm. Although to his complete defense, that was not for lack of trying on his part. Pucks are just not going in for him right now. Uh, but he he certainly has been playing well. But there has definitely been a puck luck hangover over him. And uh, okay, S- sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interject. Sam Carrick, I mean, you still got big names on the goals. You got Sam Carrick, you've got Andrew Agazino, and you've got Andrew Podorowski. So, you know, how about them? They are still getting it done. They are battling through the Zegers hangover. Uh, but two of them are usually in a line together. It's either Carrick or Agazino will center Podorowski and a rotating cast of wingers, or in some cases, maybe defensemen because the goals are, you know, in a weird place with their roster right now. Uh, but the other usually centers DeLeo and mostly Kindop in recent games. And Kindop hasn't found the score sheet in March, despite getting promoted to the top six three games ago. So that's not great. Um, but this was something we worried about a little bit ago after Zegris took that initial trip to Anaheim. Uh, and that was that the goals were only an upper body injury away or two in Anaheim from seeing that suddenly, that seemingly deep uh, core suddenly have the bottom fall out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what we're seeing here as I believe Anaheim currently has four players on IR for various reasons. So they are rotating a cast of guys from the goals through to try and, you know, be taxi squad players and get some, you know, get some games in the show, but it's definitely had an effect in San Diego. Lucas Dostal hasn't been terrible over the Zegers hangover. But he certainly hasn't been good. 891 save percentage over that stretch, never allowing uh, fewer than three goals. So he definitely has not been done doing any favors to Anaheim, but there's also not been a lot of favors done in front of him. So that's been kind of a concern. Um, Jamie Drysdale is making his NHL debut tonight, so congrats to him. But I think there's at least a 30% chance that this is the last we've seen of him in a San Diego Gulls jersey, which means nothing good for San Diego. And the hits just keep on coming from a team that we were, you know, really high on in the preseason. Uh, this this is starting to look a little bit like that worst case scenario we talked about uh, for them in the preseason. I mean... I feel like they're at the point that the Colorado Eagles were at at the beginning of the year, or at least towards the beginning of the year when the avalanche suffered so many injuries and the Eagles are still kind of suffering from that because of the fact that Pavel Fransos, uh, the avalanche's normal backup goaltender is on long-term IR. So you've got a goaltending situation with the Eagles where Adam Werner hasn't has, you know, underwhelmed in spite of the fact that the Eagles took three of those four games, but yeah, um, back to the goals. <laughs> you, you, the goals are now 500. You know, after after you know trailing Henderson in second place for the the good portion of those first you know what eight ten games of the season. Now you look at the standings. You got San Diego in fourth, nine nine and zero after 18 games played, and Colorado is six six and two. So, you know, after 14 games played, so it's like yeah. the goals are trending in the wrong direction. And speaking of, oh, go ahead. And as they, they're trending in the wrong direction and it does not look from, you know, where we are now. If I have to look down the road a little further, it ain't looking like it's going to rebound. Especially if you have Zegers and Drysdale up with Anaheim for the rest of the season. I mean, Anaheim, they're kind of foolish not to, you know, pull up Zegers after what they saw in the AHL and, they're doing the same with Drysdale because they obviously feed off of each other. Like that stat you dropped about Drysdale dropping off after Zegris, you know, <laughs> after Zegris left. So, like I said, trending in the wrong direction. Another team trending in the opposite direction that they want to is the Tucson Roadrunners. So, Sean, let's talk Tucson. Yeah, Tucson hasn't been any better recently. They're one in six in March. Ooh. That only win? San Diego. San Diego. I believe in German, it means... No, I'm not going to say that. (laughs) You stay classy, Cece. You stay... (laughs) Thank you, Shawnee. (laughs) Tucson Tucson has been 
routinely sleepwalking through portions of games recently. And then they suddenly wake up in the third and they're behind and they're like, oh, we better start being a real hockey team here. We got, you know, a game to try and win. And that usually does not go well for them. Uh, and now because the Coyotes, there, there's actually a new law in Arizona that got passed where Ranta and Kemper cannot be healthy at the same time for more than two weeks. Ah, so okay. <laughs> I, I feel like this has been going on for the Coyotes for years where it's just like, oh, Ranta's finally healthy and then Kemper gets hurt. And that like good one, two that they had going uh, is now just a one. And then, you know, Kemper finally works his way back to health and we need to start him every game now because Ronce is down. Like it's, it's, and in this case, you know, that means the Roadrunners have had to play Chris Nell in that uh, against Ontario. And he was a middling mm. ECHL goalie. And well, that game went about as you would expect when you put that kind of player into that scenario. Um, now, what happens going forward with that? Are they able to pull someone else in, you know, send Aiden Hill back down to get uh, some games in and try and, you know, balance the load a little bit and just do the, you know, basically uh three card Monty of goaltenders through the taxi squad in the AHL. Um, I don't know. I, I will say their power play also still concerns me. Um, it it's, doing this like it's starting to look more and more like Hershey's power play when I squint at it. And that is not a compliment. Um, it, if you're not, not sure what I mean by that, you know, rewind a little bit to the timestamp that I, we talk about Hershey and you'll learn, but they're, they're doing a lot more of the same where I feel like they're not trying to work the insides. They're not looking for one timers. It's they're not using what has been very effective and standard techniques across pro hockey uh, for power play usage. And ones that I still think can be improved upon but they're not trying something more ingenious or like tactically um, diverse. They're more just going back to what used to work like 10 years ago and really doesn't anymore. Um, and that's not a good trend that plus the goaltending problems they have and the not being able to seem to find 60 minutes of good hockey or even just motivated hockey from this team. This is going to be a get right series. I think for one of these teams, but I have no idea which one. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. And, uh, okay, the weekend series. <laughs> get right. The get right series. Who's it going to be? Um, we've got, let me look at times here. Sorry. Uh, Saturday, March 20th at 5 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time, because uh, as well as the goaltender law that that took in effect, Arizona also doesn't observe daylight savings time. So they're still... They're they're well. They're currently on Mountain Standard Time. At least they got one good thing going for them. Absolutely. Uh, Sunday, March twenty first is five p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So uh, yeah, San Diego heading over to Tucson, uh, playing the double game set. Uh, Sean, <laughs> I I, uh, I I I painfully hesitate to ask, but who do you got? I'm going to put a qualifier on mine. If Chris Nell starts one of these games for Tucson, uh, mm -hmm. San Diego wins. If okay. they manage to find a non-Chris Nell goalie in that mix, if that's Prosvitov or Aiden Hill or somebody else, um, then I will, I will take uh, Tucson to win those games. So it is going to basically come down of, does Tucson get to play a goalie that is an AHL goalie? If yes, I think that they take it away because I think that San Diego is just too depleted of a roster at this point. You know, they're playing defensemen at forward. And that's been a good patchwork for a game or two in the sense that it hasn't been a complete disaster. But I I don't think Tucson has the firepower. Whereas I look at Tucson's, or I don't think San Diego has the firepower. I look at Tucson's roster and I'm like, this should still be competitive. They just need to, you know, take the smelling salts in pregame, first intermission, second intermission, and that'll, you know, magically solve all their problems. Like I, I have to believe that Tucson is a better team than this, whereas at least I can look at San Diego's roster and say, yeah, but defensemen on the wings, some, you know, kind of bottom six guys playing middle six roles. That's not great. Whereas Tucson, it just seems like they have an ECHL goalie and not a lot of fight. You know, this, um, 
this really <laughs> this is the first series that I really remember that I've felt kind of uh you know not thrilled at all to to pick this series like both teams yeah, we've covered it they they're they're sucking it up right now and on paper like the names that we've mentioned you know in in the past for San Diego and in past episodes for for Tucson you know it's like which team wants it less for crying out loud? You know, it's like somebody's got to, somebody's got to wake up, like you said, with the smelling salts and everything. So uh, I begrudgingly pick a split because I, you I know, mean, give San Diego, sure, Saturday, give Tucson Sunday. Um, yeah, because those are the games that they're playing, right? Yeah, Saturday and Sunday. I mean, it's just like, how can you even, how can you even choose this series? Like, and, and daylight savings record, advantage. Daylight Tucson's going to get at least one. There you go. There you go. And by the way, as kind of a sidebar, real quick, I did want to say, oh, excuse me, as my tongue falls over my my teeth here, I would confuse and and it just based on the names only. And I know they have no, you know, correlation to each other whatsoever. I would confuse Chris Nell and Aiden Hill sometimes. You know, when I first started covering hockey four years ago. And now they're on the they're in the same friggin' organization. <laughs> so I just find that really funny that uh, the hockey gods are like, okay, CC, let's not confuse us anymore because now you have them on on the same team or in the same organization, rather. So I just found that kind of funny. But anyway, I digress. Sean, what does the model have to say about this series? The model favors Tucson uh, in a, a pretty a non. A non-tiny way. They are a 56.4% favorite uh, for each game. Uh, I think that uh, it sees the Gulls roster right now, and that's uh, this was taken with Jamie Drysdale still on it. I didn't update it, uh, you know, in the brief amount of time in which he was announced out. So Tucson is probably going to be a slightly bigger favorite than that with Drysdale out of the lineup. Should he stay out of the lineup? Um, but they they have to. It has to see you know the the Gulls lineup and be like. Yeah, on paper, that other team's a, a little bit better. That That's, you know, my very statistically uh, dense v- version of explaining, uh, you know, 5,000 lines of coding. <laughs> that's fair. That is fair. Well, um, we, okay, before we go into the speed round, let's take a quick break, listen to our sponsors, maybe purchase some products from our sponsors. But in any case, please listen to our sponsors because, you know, Sean needs to continue to drink Guinness in his motherland of Ireland. So that that's Sorry. costly. <laughs> there you go. That's costly and and I'm not paying for it. So please have a listen. We'll be right back. All right, we're back from our advertisements and we're going to crack our knuckles, loosen up a little bit, and get ready for the speed round. Here we go. Belleville and on and, and Toronto. I almost said Belleville and Ontario. Belleville and Toronto. Who do you got, Sean? Uh, Belleville is um not good. Uh, Marlies look like they're getting their uh, goalie reinforcements. I'm taking the Marlies to sweep. Okay. Um, I don't know if Anton Forsberg is going to be available for Belleville this weekend, but I'm going to pick a split anyway. Lehigh Valley and Wilkesbury Strand. Go. I think Lehigh Valley is the better team, but I feel like Sam Sherman's likely to see a game in the series, and I'm not going to the same train, go split. Whichever game Legacy starts, that's the one looks very strange for me. CC. Of course. Always on the, always on the Legacy train, for sure. Um, I'm going to say a split as well, and uh, yeah, we'll keep it at that. Keep the train rolling. Bakersfield in Ontario. Go Sean. Ontario's making progress, but the Condors are too good. Uh, the Condors sweep, but the rain take both through the wire because of moonshine. Of course. Well, hey, Ontario has won their last four games, so I'm going to pick them. And then I'm going to pick Bakersfield. We'll go with the split again. Big surprise. So let's talk San Jose and Henderson. Sean, who do you got? San Jose's rotating uh, roster nightmare continues, but Vegas made it, just made a big call for guys like Sakura and Bischoff. I have no idea when they'll be back. Uh, I'm going to pick against Henderson for at least one of these games. I say San Jose takes Saturday's game. Yeah, I'm gonna say that. Uh, I'm gonna say that as well because you know Henderson losing guys, they're human and fallible just like anybody else. So I'm gonna say Henderson takes that first game and San Jose takes the second one. 
All right, back out east. Let's talk Providence and Hartford. Sean. Jack, Sean, and Dan Vladar just got called up to Boston. Sean's making his NHL debut, I believe, tonight. If they're back in Marlboro in time, I will take the Bruins. Otherwise, we'll back all the way. I got to stick to my 19, 20 games for Providence this year. Providence sweep against Hartford. Last but not least, Grand Rapids, Grand Rapids at Cleveland. Shawnee. Hard for me to get a read on Cleveland. Griffin is looking better recently, but that PK versus Cleveland power play scares me. I'll say monsters. Uh, this is tough. Central Division's all over the place this year. I'm going to say uh, we're going to go with the split. Whew. And we're done. <laughs> All right. Well, that was the speed round. I'm always wiped yeah. out after that. That's it for the show. If you guys are enjoying the show, please make sure you subscribe so you get episodes in a timely fashion. Also, please rate and review the podcast wherever you are listening to it from. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, like the video and comment what you thought of the episode. Doing so helps others find the show and your reviews help us improve it. You can also follow the show on social media at Calder Farmstead on Twitter, at the Calder Farmstead on Instagram and Facebook. Links to all of that and more can be found on our link tree, which is scrolling below here. But if you're listening on an audio version, it is linktr.ee slash the Calder Farmstead. CC. My name is CC Hockley. You can find me representing Full Press Hockey on Twitter at FPC underscore AHL and at my personal Twitter account at CC Hawk. That's S E E S E E H A W K. Of course, mainly hockey, but hey, I talk music every now and again. And other sports as well so give me a follow and check me out um i promise if it's interesting to me it's not going to be bullshit for you check out my writing on full press coverage network on the full press coverage network rather at www.fullpresshockey.com and as always the called the calder farmstead is part of the full press radio network follow us other great hockey podcasts and other great sports related programs at www dot full press coverage.com sean i'm sean o'brien you can find me on twitter at sean o'brien 81 that's s-e-a-n-o-b-r-i-e-n-8-1 i'm also on instagram which is getting better as the time goes on and i learn to take pictures hey, uh, that's at sean o'brien underscore 81 uh both are personal accounts so uh you know most my twitter is mostly hockey but also uh i'm sure once i suffer through the Snyder cut. I will be talking about how terrible it is. And, you know, my Instagram is mostly the pictures of me and my dog or random things in the world. Uh, but if you're interested in the hockey uh, models that we've been talking about, as well as, you know, where we're pulling these PDO numbers and stuff like that from, all of that is on my Tableau page. You can find that at bit.ly slash data dump and chase, all lowercase, all one word. Big thanks to Adrian Drake, who made our theme music. You can find him on social media at AD underscore dysfunction, D-Y-S-F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N, so we can make music for you too. Cece, take us home. That is it for episode number 21 of the Calder Farmstead. For Sean O'Brien, I am Cece Hockley. Thank you all for tuning in, and as always, keep your stick on the ice.